Welcome everyone. Please share in the text chat uh, wh where you're joining us from today, what you do and what piques uh, your interest in this topic. Uh, today we're joined by Angela Benson and we'll have Michelle Hatley join us soon for this third webinar um, on research and culture learning and technology which is an Emerge Africa and AECT culture learning and technology division uh, collaboration. I thought I'd introduce our speakers, uh, our presenters for today. So Angela's here already. Angela is Instructional Technology uh, Associate Professor at the University of Alabama in the US and her current research investigates the role of culture in technology mediated learning spaces. She's published more than 40 academic publications, presented at loads and loads of conferences, and she teaches on courses in instructional technology. I'm going to share a link where you can find a bit more info on the speakers. And then we've got Lachelle, who is PhD uh, and Assistant Professor of Computer Science at Copeland State University in Baltimore. And she's the founder and executive director of Uplift, which is a non-profit STEM education organization. Okay, how are you guys sharing in the text chat? Let's see, no shares yet. Okay, please share where you're joining us from today, what to do, what, what you do, and what piqued your interest uh, in today's topic. Focus of typing, great. Um, while we're waiting for Lachelle, I'm wondering if we can hand over to, to Angela. Um, perhaps you can, we can have a conversation around um, how we can get more perhaps uh, involved in this topic. Okay, thank you very much, Nicola. Nicola thank you. <laughs> I'm having, a, a, I guess, a good time with uh, learning to pronounce everybody's name correctly. And uh, that's a very important part of, I think, the work that we do. Um, we have students who come to the U.S. and uh, they actually adopt uh, new names because uh, us, we in the U.S. tend to butcher people's names. And so rather than see their names butchered, they adopt a new name. I try to learn, though, to pronounce people's actual names in order to give them that level of respect. So if I mispronounce your name, please correct me, and I will do my best to, to not, not make that mistake again. Uh, one of my students emailed me because I uh, spelled her name wrong. And she said, Dr. Benson, that's not how I spell my name. And I feel, I can't think of now the word, no, no. And she said, thank you for spelling it correctly and showing respect or something. And uh, I don't know, I just thought it was a very interesting moment to know that uh, misspelling her name was an issue. I guess people misspell my name a lot. And uh, I don't know, just very interesting. But learning to respect people in those kind of ways is part of the work that we do. Uh, as a group, the Cultural Learning and Technology Division of AECT is uh, honored that you allowed us to participate with you for the last three weeks. Uh, we thank you very much for being with us uh, each, and I'm going to say morning because it's uh, 6 o'clock in the morning here, though I know it's 1 o'clock in the afternoon for several of you on the call. But uh, we do appreciate your presence. Now, I see some names in the list who were people who won copies of the book. If you, were a co if you won a copy of the book, Culture Learning and Technology Research and Practice, Will you let me know by typing in the chat box whether you've received your ebook or you're still waiting on it? And while you're doing that, I'm going to skip past um, Lachelle's slides and go to some slides that I had prepared in summary.
at least I'm learning to pause now while people are, are typing since the system actually tells me that you are typing. Okay. Oh, serious games. That's very interesting. Um, uh, Lachelle, some of Lachelle's work is in that area, so hopefully she'll get on the call this morning. Mm, very interesting, Nicola. Uh, as we talked before, we take a very broad perspective of, of culture. So uh, we embrace all that research. Human capacity development in Nairobi. It's great, Eileen. Mm. Okay, so I'm a, nobody has written about the book yet, so I'm assuming everyone is waiting to get their copy if they were a winner and no one has gotten theirs yet. Is that correct? Is that Olofemi? Am I pronouncing that correctly? Hmm. Industry. Okay. So what I plan to do as a way of summarizing these three is these three weeks of work that we've done is to go back and revisit um, the kinds of research that's being done or that's needed at the intersection of cultural learning and technology. Um, when I use the word research, I use that word very broadly. I guess you can say I use all words very broadly. So research doesn't have to be necessarily that I collected some, um, I did a formal data collection process and I had a methodology, but I'm talking about any contribution that we can make to the academic community as well as to the popular and the local community. Um, our, the, our voices, these voices need to be heard within the academic community, but they also need to be heard beyond the academic community. So we're looking at, when we use the word research, we're looking at ways of reaching all populations, not limiting it, not limiting it to a, an academic population. It does seem to be a little bit slower than usual, but I am trying to keep up with the chat comments as well as to uh, to do the presentation. So what research is needed at the intersection of cultural learning and technology, and why do we need that research? Uh, as we talked about and as you saw in some of the presentations that we had, especially the presentations from Amy from Deepak and from um, Michael Thomas, um, research that applies critical perspectives to argue for equity and inclusion in educational technology research and practice. Okay, thank you, Nicola. I think that it's just very, very important that we are out there critiquing what's happened. So when I look at the, the critical perspectives category of research, what kind of research do we need? We need to be able to look at our past practice and to critique that so that we can learn from it. Um, Deepak did that historical study of uh, cultural diversity within the ed tech field. And it's important to see where we came from 
and the decisions that got us there so that we can understand better where we are and we can make better decisions about how we move forward. Another thing that we want to do with critical perspectives work is we want to challenge current practice. It was very instructive to me when Nicola mentioned that uh, some of the students on the UCT campus were um, protesting and how uh, blended learning was being used as a way to continue the coursework despite the student protest and how that from an administrative position was a very positive move but from the position of the students that could have been that it was not seen as positive it was seen as a way from from the way I understood it it, it was seen as a way to subvert the protest and and not have it yield its greatest impact so it's, it's important for us who do this work to challenge current practice. And this is not just the practice of other people. This is our own practice. When we look at the tools that we use to empower students and to empower people. Uh, we also need to look at the ways that these tools are used to, used to disenfranchise. And then we come up with ways to um, um, subvert that disenfranchise disenfranchisement, if that's a word. And then another reason that we do that work is because we want to direct future practice. We don't critique just for the sake of critique. We don't challenge just for the sake of challenge. We do these things in order to provide for a better today and a better tomorrow. So sometimes people think about critical work as work that is passive. But critical work is very, 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 very active. And it leads to uh, a change in awareness that results in a change in practice. We also need research that, in, that employs culture-based frameworks. Now, uh, some of the frameworks that, we, that, that people presented over the last three weeks was, I think it was Hofstede's Cultural Dimensions Framework. Uh, we looked at Bennett's developmental model of intercultural sensitivity. And this kind of work is important because it allows us to operationalize culture. That's what these frameworks allow us to do. Now, some people don't like the notion of operationalizing culture. But uh, from my perspective, it's important for us to be on all sides of this issue. So if we can operationalize it in a way that is meaningful to us, it will better serve the greater community. What these cultural frameworks also allow us to do is to assess cultural sensitivity. You know, we talk about we want change. How do we know when change happens within groups and within individuals? What kind of uh, interventions or activities promote the development of intercultural sensitivity? So those are the kinds of things that these culture-based frameworks can help us to assess and to identify. And by having these culture-based frameworks, we're also able to explore the influence of culture in a lot of different areas. If you look at some of the work that people are doing, they're taking these culture, they're, opera they're operationalizing culture, and then they're tying it into these other models. So there may be models that don't address culture, and people are looking at ways that we can actually integrate culture into these models because, you know, culture is a factor. And typically the reason culture is not addressed is because we assume that the dominant culture is in fact the only culture. And we know that that's not true. So we are looking to uh, apply culture-based frameworks and even to develop new culture-based frameworks. That kind of work is very much needed. And then we need research that provides platforms for the voices and experiences of people and groups underrepresented or marginalized in education and education research. Um, and a lot of the work that has been done, um, underrepresented people and marginalized people, and that's why we are underrepresented and marginalized, we were not included. So the reason we need to do this kind of work is that we need to challenge current means and stereotypes. Uh, we need to tell our stories. We need to share with others in telling collective stories 
so that a true picture of ourselves and our culture is presented in the academic literature and in the broader community. Um, uh, people make a lot of assumptions. And so the one way to combat assumptions is to tell a story from a, a very personal perspective. What focusing on uh, marginalized and underrepresented groups also does is it allows us to refine or refute current models. As I said before, a lot of the models that we use in instructional technology, they did not consider culture. Or if they did, they considered only the dominant culture. So what does it mean when we apply those models to marginalized groups, to underrepresented groups? Do the models hold up? Do the models need refining? Or do we need new models? And that's, and that's, and that's the challenge, I think, for us in this work, is to be able to uh, critique current models, to collect data so that we can refine those models, and even in some cases to be able to refute those models. And what I also hope to see is for us to be able to, is to be able to develop new models. Um, there's always room for new. And Patricia Young, and she was not one of our presenters in this group, but she developed a culture-based model of instructional design in 2008-2009. And it was just a very, it was just a new way of looking at instructional technology. I mean, um, instructional design. And some of us looked at that work and we said, it's amazing that people don't already do this in their current practice. And other people looked at that work and said, you know, I never really thought about doing it that way. So a lot of times we have the ideas that can help others know how to incorporate the perspectives of the marginalized and the underrepresented, but we don't share them because to us they're natural, but to other people they aren't natural. So we really do need to develop these new models. Hmm. I see your questions, Nicola. Hmm. Um, and uh, next steps. Now, this was a, a short intro, a short conclusion. I think uh, where this work needs to go is we, and when I say we, I mean those of us who are involved in the Cultural Learning and Technology Division, AECT specifically, but even a broader group of everybody who's interested. We welcome your invitation, and when I say your, I'm talking about those of you involved in the Emerge Africa Network. We welcome your invitation to join you in this work, and we invite you to join us in this work. Uh, I think that there is power in our collective voices, our collective experiences, and um, bringing those voices together can and will make a difference uh, in it tech practice and in it tech research. So that's where I hope we are able to go, so that we can begin a collaboration that will that starts with these webinars but goes way beyond these webinars. And one of the things that we've been talking to uh, Nicola and Jakob and uh, a few others at um, Emerge Africa has been this notion of developing uh, cross-cultural research groups, research groups that include uh, U.S. scholars and African scholars on the same research team, looking at maybe similar problems from the same perspective in some cases or from different perspectives in other cases, and beginning to um, learn how to work together collaboratively and then, too, to begin to address some of this need in the cultural learning and technology research. So I'm looking for great things to come of this collaboration, and I hope that many of you will want to be involved in it. So that was about all that I had for this morning. I am open to addressing any questions that you have, any comments that you have. And I'd like to just hear, I mean, if you feel like typing in the box, you know, what do you see as the, as the issues facing us now 
in this no in the space of culture learning and technology what kind of work do you see as being needed to be done and what kind of work are you interested in doing Hi Angela, I thought um, while folks are typing and um, yeah, if you want to take the mic, and you, you're free to type the M. Um, I thought I'd show along, just share something I'm working on with some uh, colleagues at UCT. Um, we did game studies research in contexts in Cape Town and basically what, what we, we, uh, we're writing a chapter for a book on uh, gaming across the digital divide, uh, perspectives from the global south. And we're saying that a lot of the sort of research on, it's not necessarily ed tech, but I know sometimes people put games under the broader ed tech umbrella. Um, we're saying, well, a lot of the literature talks about technology, infrastructures of abundance. And our chapter sort of aims to challenge people's thinking about what kinds of gaming practices are recognized um, and also about, ex I, I think more the aim is to expand diversity in the field because if you're a, say, a games researcher in another country, when you read particular literature you think, well, okay, this is not really fitting uh, with the things I'm, I'm observing. I'm not, I wondered if other folks, perhaps you have similar experiences. Um, where you read things coming from uh, the global north or from other scholars and you think, okay, that doesn't quite fit what, what I'm seeing um, or the kinds of things you're observing is not, is not represented in the literature. Uh, and then my follow-up question for Angela, I think, I'm hoping you guys type, come on, <laughs> I hope you can share some ideas, is um, sort of what, what, what we do as sort of marginalized voices um, in changing, I guess, collectively uh, the sort of diversity within the field. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, uh, I want to comment first on your, on your comment about gaming and uh, how the perspectives from the Global South and the Global North might be different. And, the, you know, and to the perspective from technology rich areas might be different from the perspectives of areas that aren't as technology rich. We face that same thing. I mean, typically, you know, in the US, and I shouldn't say in the US as a whole, because, you know, we have the same the same disparities with technology that exist across the world we have in this country. But a lot of times we ignore that or we forget that and that becomes that notion of marginalized. I mean, since everybody has high tech, we don't have to worry about people who don't because there are so few of them. But that's an, that's not true. So we do that marginalization. But one thing that I like about Michael Thomas's work and another colleague of mine who's here at the university who are, who's doing and both of Mike is doing work and Michael spoke last week. Uh, Michael is doing work in gaming and I have a colleague in my department, Andre Denham who's also doing work in gaming. And this is just a, uh, uh, what do you call it? When you think about yourself more than you think about other people. My first thought when they told me that they did gaming was it was a computer game. Or maybe it was a video game. But you know, I'm thinking it was something high tech. And both of them started with a board game. Mike started with a card game, which if you had a card, you can play the game. And my colleague at the at the university started with some type of board game. And so and then when they think about how to grow these games, they think about ways that the technology can be used to carry out the games. But the game is not dependent on the technology. The game is dependent upon the rules of gaming and whatever the game pieces are. 
So I really do like their approach to to gaming because it's not a, a high tech approach that excludes people who don't have access to high tech. So uh, your comment about how we can work together collaboratively. Um, I think that I think that it began small. I think that within AECT, and that's our that's our major group. Um, within AECT, uh, we just started the Cultural Learning and Technology Division maybe four years ago. So, and we are beginning to see an impact. But I think that it's slow and steady work. You know what I mean? I think that there are breakthroughs that happen. And I think that we are at a moment like that now within AECT. The book that we did uh, and that we've been talking about and giving away in this session just won a major award at AECT. That kind of visibility helps the book, but it also puts the, the ideas in the book at the forefront of the discussion. So it's very important for us to be ready at all times to address these issues. So we, as people who worked in the book, are continuously being asked for our perspective on, on issues from a cultural perspective. And sometimes you want to say, you know, stop asking me. But we have to be willing to answer those questions that people ask us in the beginning. And hopefully to bring those people along so that they can become the answerers of the questions as well and not just the askers. I also think that, and I really do believe in the power of collaboration. I think that bringing together uh, scholars and practitioners from Emerge Africa and CLT, I think just us doing work together highlights that work in the academic community and in the broader community. Because what it says is that we're not only, we not only talk about culture, but we live culture. Because even though we're marginalized communities, we're, we're different marginalized communities. We share a lot, but we, there are a lot of differences in our context. And for us to be able to work together, we're going to face a lot of the challenges that people face within our communities in working together. And so that's going to give us a greater insight. So, uh, and I've been pushing this, and I'm going to continue to push this. Uh, we really need to begin to do some collaborative work, even though it's going to be difficult, because we're going to have to negotiate the technology. We're going to have to negotiate the difference in time zones. We may have to negotiate some language issues. But we need to do these things. We need to face these challenges. We need to come up with solutions so that we can share those solutions with other people who choose to do this kind of work along with us or after us. So uh, you can give me a follow-up question, Nicola, Nicola, while I read some of the responses that are here. Yeah, Angela, um, Anna has an interesting, uh, well, I think, a question. She's wanting to hear whether there are anything around creating diversity-friendly learning experiences in the case of very uh, diverse classes and probably very large classes as well, like, like MOOCs. Um, she says, I don't think a lowest common denominator to, to culture approach helps anyone, but traditional old-fashioned teaching models also don't work well considering the high dropout rates, is there perhaps some sort of meta-culture that links the participants? So it sounds I think that's a great... Oh, go ahead, go ahead, Nicola. Um, yeah, so I take it, I, I know she was interested, uh, she said in one of the previous uh, webinars that she's interested in doing a PhD, so I'm not sure, maybe you can type in the text chat if you're, you're thinking of a PhD topic around this line. Um, okay, over to you, Angela. I think this is a great question, and it's a question that's faced in MOOCs, which, which, which tend to be very large, but it's a question today that's faced even in smaller classrooms. Um, and, and this is why this broad view of culture really helps. Now, I teach very small classes. I, my biggest class probably has 20 people in it, which is a very small class I know. But within those 20 people, what we have are, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to your question specifically, Anna, but I want to give this example. In that class, we have people who have different professional backgrounds. We have people who work in K-12, 
people who work in higher ed, uh, people who work in business and industry, and those people bring different perspectives to the classroom. We have people who work daytime jobs. We have people who work evening jobs. We have people who work on the weekends. We have people who work during the week. So there are a lot. There, my my comment is that this is a very heterogeneous group. What they have in common is that they are all interested in ed tech because they're enrolled in an ed tech program and they're all pursuing this degree. So the kinds of things that we've done on a small scale that I also think can work on a large scale is that, and it takes up some support to do this, is that we provide opportunities for these students to engage with each other uh, rather than the teacher doing all the engagement. And so let me give you an example of that. And some of these models will work in MOOCs depending on how your MOOC is structured, and some of them won't. Some of them won't. Uh, what I tend to do in my classes is I provide a short, and I teach a lot of blended courses, and a lot of, uh, I teach a blended course that meets in person at the beginning of the semester and at the end of the semester and meets online the rest of the time. So when we meet in the first session, we get a chance to know each other, at least to put a name to the face. And people get to know me because we meet for about four hours at first time. And the rest of our interaction is online until the end of the semester. So some things that we do as an instructor, I want the students to get to know me. So I tend to do um, introductory videos for each topic area that we're going to do. And then I do um, sort of closing or follow-up um, video so that, so that I can sort of wrap it up for students. But one thing that I do that students have really, really liked is I, I put students in charge of the content. So what I do is instead of me, and I say I give a brief overview, and it's not an overview of the content, it's really an overview of the topic. What I do is I allow students to teach students. So I, let's, let's say, for example, if we're working on a particular book, maybe that book has a, has a chapter. So I would assign, I mean, one student would be assigned to do a chapter overview for the class. One student would be assigned to find some outside resources associated with that chapter content that would help the students better understand it. Another student would be in charge of coming up with a couple of discussion questions and leading a discussion amongst those students. And so in that way, those students get to bring whatever perspective they have to the table and they get to share it with, with the rest of the class. So everybody has an opportunity at some point to do an overview. Everybody has an opportunity at some point to find some outside resources. And everybody has an opportunity at some point to, um, to lead a discussion. And that way, they get to know each other and they get to bring in their varied perspectives. What I found is that students love hearing from each other. We have international students in some of these classes. So students love hearing about the, the different perspectives that different students have on issues. If it be that I'm a teacher in K-12 and you're a teacher in higher ed. Uh, I'm a business person from China. You're a business person from Australia. It doesn't really matter, but people just like that way of being able to engage. Uh, a good book that may help you with thinking about uh, activities that you can put in a MOOC because everything will have to be tailored to about how big yours is, how much you can involve your students. And what you can also do is, okay, let me tell you the book first. And I'm going to find the URL for the book because it's a free book that you can download. Um, what you can also do is like once these students create these resources, you don't have to throw them away. You can keep those resources. And those resources become um, connected to the course. So when the next group of students come along, they have those resources to build on. So now they get to interact with students that they've never really met. But those students' resources are still there, and they get to hear those student perspectives. The book that I want to tell you about is the Curtis Bonk book. Uh, have you all heard of Curtis Bonk? Yes, that's, that's exactly right. They do, in fact, become educational resources that the students can take with them or resources that 
that you can use and reuse in your class. But that's what the students really like about it. Uh, this semester, in one of my classes, when they do their work, we create them in a Google Doc. And so everybody gets to see everybody else's Google Doc. And what students are doing is they're compiling many books of the work of not just their work, but the work of everybody in the classroom. And, and it's just been phenomenal. And I can imagine that if you had a MOOC and you were doing something like that, and depending on how many students you have, that could be a very rich repository. I'm trying to get my students to the point, and a lot of instructors have already done it, but we end up creating an open source book from these resources that we create in the class. And if you're doing, anyway, let me stop. I'll stop talking. Okay, I mean, let me pull up his book right quick and, and put the URL in. And I use this book in my class because it's free. He has a lot of other books that aren't free. But if you go to his web page and if you get, and if you put, I think you have to put in your email address, but I promise you, he does not send you spam email. The book is called Tech Variety. Let me see if I can read. 100 Plus Activities for Motivating and Retaining Learners Online. Now, this book really does have 100 activities in it. Now, you're not going to use all 100 activities, and you may not even use one activity in the exact same way that a bunk uses that, those activities. But there are so many variations on them. And that's what he encourages you. So he starts with the idea, but that idea can be adapted to any environment. So I think what we have to do, Anna, is that we have to be creative. And what it, meant, what it has meant for me is giving up control in my classroom. You know, it, and, and that was not a very easy place for me to get to. Because I know what I want you to know, but I had to trust the students that they would pick out the important points as well. And it has been phenomenal. Uh, anyway, I, I talk a lot, so I'm going to stop a minute and do some reading. Maybe I'll take the mic while you're doing some reading, Angela. Okay. Um, I just thought I'd share an experience I had at the AATT convention, um, just picking up on the chat here with Anna that, um, you know, we, we have in, in, in one of the courses, or well, two of the courses I co-teach on, um, our students are from different countries in Africa, um, African higher education sector mostly, and they come with very particular sort of experiences around teaching and learning. Some institutions are, are the teaching still very uh, traditional, so transmissive, stage on the stage, very delivery focused teacher as authority. Um, so when they do more social learning exercises, one actually has to teach um, things like how to be a critical friend, um, making peer feedback part of an assessment. Um, and I found that that's quite, um, you know, we, we weren't alone in that. So when I went to the ACT convention and spoke to a few people, um, they said they're, they're, they're finding some of the things as well. And I think there was a pre the presentation uh, from someone who taught an online course with, I think it was Turkish and Japanese students. And also, you know, sort of uh, cultural sort of backgrounds, meaning um, their previous experiences shaped um, whose voice and whose, whose feedback that value, um, whether it would be the lecturer or the students. Uh, their peers. Um, so that, that's, uh, that I think is quite um, one topic, I think those social relationships and teaching and learning, that that is definitely um, something we need to explore. And I think Anna, I think, I think it was Anna, I just, I'm trying to catch up, made the point that, you know, I think someone, was it Anna who said that students have to be ingrained in this type of learning? I have found that and this is something I think that we as technology people now, and you know we talk about technology as process technology and uh, product technology, it could be high tech or low tech. But as technology people, I think we have to become comfortable with change and the discomfort that change causes for our students. Um, because they're not, they, these are new ideas to them. Uh, I don't know if you have this same uh, leisure in a MOOC, 
But see, in our classes, we get to see students over and over. So we get to develop a relationship with them. But uh, an example, this semester for the first time, and I don't know if you all use Twitter, but I use Twitter in my class. Now, I use Twitter in my class when I don't really know how to use Twitter. Now, that was a challenge in itself. So, you know, I had a Twitter account, but I just never used it. But I wanted to get better at it. So I decided that we're going to do Twitter in this class. I'm telling you, I think for the first four weeks, my students were sending hitmen to kill me because they hated Twitter. And what I found is that they did not hate Twitter. They hated the discomfort of doing something different. So what I got them to do is I got them to, uh, every week I allowed them to give me feedback. And I'm going to write about some of the feedback that I got. I mean, some of it was like, why are we doing this? I hate this. Let's go back to the discussion board. But I just, every week I would say, let's be patient. And we modified how we did the Twitter chats to work for our class. So we used Twitter a bit differently than the way that they use it in their uh, social lives. And so we found a way that works for the class. And after about, Maybe it was four or five weeks. I asked the class, did we want to continue with Twitter or did we want to go back to our discussion board? And believe it or not, everybody in the class wanted to continue with Twitter. Most people recognized that their uh, dislike of Twitter was not really about Twitter. It was about their discomfort communicating in another space in another way. They gained an appreciation for trying to, to share a thought in 140 characters. Well, when we first start, started this, that was very, very frustrating to them. So they were able to develop some new skills by communicating in this new space. Now, I'm not saying that everybody has to do Twitter, but when we work in this space where we're having people to work with technology, we have to learn to be comfortable with our students' discomfort. We have to learn to be comfortable with our own discomfort. And so, that's one thing. And the second thing, and then I'm going to stop again, is, you know, when we have people of different cultures and people bring all these different perspectives to the classroom, a lot of times we say, let's find common ground. You know, we don't really need to find common ground. We need to embrace the different grounds that we all bring. So instead of saying, how can we find common ground, the question that I try to ask myself is, how can we exploit our different grounds? How can we bring those differences out as opposed to thinking that everybody is the same? And, and that's a challenge, but it's a different way of thinking about the class. So I'm not always trying to find commonalities. I'm trying to find ways that showcase differences. Anyway, so I'm going to stop and let somebody else talk for a while. Um, yeah, I want to pick up with this the, on the chat with Andre here. He was talking about um, is it a good idea to cover a, a, um, an introduction course in digital culture? Um, and I think there's, there's quite a, a debate about whether digital culture um, exists because often it assumes that we're, there's something special about the medium um, that of, of digital. Um, that that is different to to face to face. Um, I thought maybe we could just you know Angela. I think we can pose that question to you. Uh, is that is there such a thing as digital culture? Thank you, um, Angela. I think you've got to turn your mic back on. And of course, I was talking, talking, talking. Sorry about that. Uh, I think this is a great question. Uh, this summer, I had the honor of attending the Digital Pedagogy Institute in uh, uh, Virginia, here in the U.S. And this notion of, and they didn't call it, it wasn't so much, well, it was, the, 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 the terminology that they used was critical digital pedagogy. And so it's sort of that, it's, I think it's sort of that notion of a digital culture, but it's the acknowledgement that the technology changes or complicates the work that we do as teachers. I'm going to provide another link. This link is from Jesse Stoll, 
And I guess I think that's how you pronounce his last name. I could be pronouncing it wrong. And basically, he talks about what critical digital pedagogy is. And he bases it on, if you remember Amy's talk, she talked about critical pedagogy. And so what he does is he brings the digital into that. So I don't know if there is a digital culture as much as there are digital cultures. Does that make sense? Because we want to, in some way, because it makes it easier for us, we want, we want, we want to say that this is what this is. But unfortunately, this has a lot of different flavors. So how do we deal with a lot of different flavors? I think that we embrace them. Just as I said with my students, communicating in the Twitterverse is very different than communicating on a discussion board. Communicating in uh, Adobe Connect, where we all have, uh, um, in this case, we don't, where we all can have the microphone and speak to each other, is very different than uh, communicating in the Twitterverse or communicating in a discussion in a discussion board. So all these spaces are really different spaces. And I guess there is some commonality, but once again, I think we have to embrace the differences. That we sh that, and this is just me, so you can feel free to totally disagree with me. But instead of trying to boil things down, I think what we try to do is we try to make them simple. So we try to boil them down to their lowest common denominator. But when we do that, maybe we're making the same error that people make when they deal with us. You know, they people don't want to deal with our differences. They want to uh, put us in a group and label that group and say, this is how that group operates. But that's not true. <coughs> there are different operations within a group. And I think that there are different operations in the digital culture. And that's what makes it so, in the digital environment. And that's what makes it, it so challenging because it is different, because it is always changing. Um, anyway, so I'm going to stop now again. Yes, we really do like recipes, even though I don't like to cook. In my house, my husband is a cook. But yeah, recipes make us feel comfortable. Great. I, I'm glad that I'm able to share these few resources with you. They have really made a difference to me. I think you know, Ma, I'm not, I'm, I want to pronounce the name correctly, Nicola. Uh, Maha? Maha, is it Bali? Yes, but it's Maha, like quick. Maha, okay. Anyway, she was at this conference. And she was actually a keynote at the Digital Pedagogy Conference this summer. And uh, I was in one of her workshops. Just a very wonderful experience. The kinds of things that we're talking about here uh, in this culture, learning, and technology webinar sessions were the kinds of things that we explored during that week that we were in Virginia together. So just a great, a great, great time. Uh, and they actually had a part that they did virtually so that people could participate virtually. So that may be something that the Emerge Africa community wants to participate in next year. If you, you may have participated this year, I'm not sure. But it was, it was a great opportunity. Okay, I'm stopping talking again. Do you think I talk a lot? <laughs> we like that you talk a lot, and we really appreciate it. Um, Maha has a very nice blog, blog post, um, and I think you know this is something, especially for our colleagues in um, African contexts who are doing educational technology research, to uh, I think engage with. Um, thinking about sort of the exclusivity uh, and, and of, of the edtech field and how we can sort of, um, how we can broaden it and bring, bring up, uh, and because it gets us to question, you know, whose voice uh, is valued and in turn um, what, what we can bring and help to grow the field. The other thing is, I think, going back to recipes, maybe it's also about just not just accepting um, other people's recipes. Um, I think, and, and goes back to critical digital pedagogy, um, thinking about, you know, what, how might this recipe look different in our context, and maybe not just ours, but um, some other spaces as well. Okay, we've got 10, 10 minutes to go. Are there any more questions for Angela? 
It looks like, unfortunately, Lachelle wasn't able to join us today. I'm, I'm looking for one more thing that I want to share with you. Let me see if I can find that. Yeah, I'm sorry she wasn't able to make it, but uh, I hope I can find this. Okay. You know, I mentioned the culture-based model by, Patric by Patricia Young. Uh, I'm going to give you a link to an article, and it seems to be a freely accessible article. It's a 2008 article. It may be a uh, way to get you to thinking about... Uh, how you might think about your work and incorporate culture. So let me see if I can, here's the link to it. <laughs> You're hooked on the link. What does that mean, Andre? <laughs> hmm. Well, I certainly appreciate everybody being so active and sharing your thoughts. Now see, this is the kind of engagement that I like. I would love to, you know, to talk more with Anna about what's happening in the MOOC and the kinds of activities she's starting to incorporate and whether that any of the activities in the bunk book work for her, how she modified them. And it's okay to start small. It really is okay to start small because, you know, small steps make a difference. And, uh, but we just, we just have to start, and then we can help those around us to start. Anyway, okay, I'm going to stop talking once again, but I'm not going to go in a rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think, I mean, I think Andre means, you know, one can, can, can go down the rabbit hole going from one, one resource to another. It's oh, oh. An interesting and wide interesting field um, once you find uh, sort of engaging articles and readings. Another one which I thought was interesting and probably relevant to the topic of culture learning and technology was a blog post where Tony Bates was reflecting on his experiences at the ICDE uh, conference and he says he had posed this question, is indigenous online learning an oxymoron? <coughs> Sharing the link to that, and I thought, hmm, okay, and I wasn't too sure how I felt about the blog post, um, but I thought, what what could could uh, you know perspectives from the culture, learning, and technology seminars that's been engaging in uh, sort of enrich uh, a perspective perspectives on those kind of things. Well, I'm going to have to look at this one. I like Tony Bates. Yeah, I do, I, I do too. And it's just... The future uh, is scary. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, and we're also related to questions that came up at eLearning Africa where um, the theme of the conference was learning in context. And some of the... the even, even the closing plenary was, it, is this what Africa needs? Um, but there was a panel on MOOCs, and in that in that panel, something that came up was this idea of um, decolonizing MOOCs. Mm. Yeah. So so that that's got gotten me thinking a bit more about, and, and I can see that as other people uh, in this field are are exploring it. Um, yeah, particularly Taskeen uh, Adam. Uh, and and a few other folks as well. And and I know I know Maha has written quite a bit on MOOCs too. Okay, so five minutes to go. Any any more questions? Perhaps Olufemi, maybe you've had some deep thoughts about critical digital pedagogy and teaching dentistry. Um, Irene, maybe rethinking some of um, facilitating online activities. So just for some context, Irene um, 
is a facilitator with me on the Facilitating Online Image Africa course. And I know Anna's done the course, Olufemi and Andre. Um, that's something that we're actually seeing is that people who have taken our online courses are become more active participants with, within our network. Yes, I can see how that happens. I was I was tempted to sign up for your uh, online learning course myself. I'm sorry, I just dropped. Well, I just want to thank you all for participating with me this morning. I'm going to tell Michelle that she missed a great time. I really, really enjoyed being with you and uh, engaging in the conversation. And I really do hope that uh, we can continue to do work together. I really look forward to building on these relationships. So thank you once again, everybody, for coming out and for sharing with me. I really do appreciate it. Thank you so much, Angela, and um, not just for the conversation and that we love, <laughs> we love that you love talking, um, but also for sharing links um, and also inspiration and backing, backtracking to the previous uh, webinars and sort of bringing us back to to that to that focus um, and thinking about how we can use some of these perspectives and frameworks uh, in our own. Uh, con context and the, and the research that, that we're doing or, or plan to do. I know some folks it might be getting feet wet stage, um, but that's fine. I think it's an, a new area for a lot of us um, and different way of thinking about things. So we're really excited um, by, by your, actually the whole, the whole webinar series. So thanks to Angela and colleagues from the Culture, Learning and Technology Division. And I hope everyone has a great day further. Uh, any final final words? Oh yes, we have. We have got e-learning and e-online conference coming up, uh, e-learning festival. So on the Emerge Africa website you'll find information about that. And we're not going to, you know, we're, we're aiming to be quite uh, inclusive, uh, and, and attendee driven and how we go about it and what what would be great since you know we look I, I think there are a lot of overlaps with the CLT research and I don't see why members of the CLT division couldn't um, present uh, and, and propose something to present as well I'm just going to share the link to that um, because we know that for many folks attending conferences face to face are quite quite expensive, um, so that's one avenue. The other, we've also got an exciting uh, event coming up, um, and I'm sure it will interest folks in your network as well, Angela. It is presented by Karen Wigner. I'm not sure if I said her surname pre uh, correctly, but it's uh, she asks why is adaptive learning important important as an e-learning tool. And she is the um, executive director of the Personalized Learning Consortium. Sharing a link to that as well. So if there are folks who are interested in adaptive learning, um, that's one not to not to be missed. Yeah, that's all I can think of uh, for now. Pleasure. And thank you all for joining us today and for um, being part of this conversation. Or this, should I say, this growing conversation. <laughs> so thanks, everybody.
Thank you.